Listening, it sounds so easy, especially if you're in the, the broadcasting business. I mean, you listen. But especially in this media environment, especially at a time as human beings when we are spending so much time communicating on, you know, on screens, it's, you know, I don't think we realize how, how the small amount of time we're actually spending listening. And you know, you, you look at other other broadcast outlets and and cable news, and I mean, it's and I have enormous respect for for a lot of, of what my colleagues do, but you know, I, I think what makes us different is you know spending the time to listen and let people think out loud and actually have raw, unpredictable, thoughtful moments. David Green is the host of NPR's Morning Edition, along with Steve Inskeep and Renee Montaigne. And uh, just a couple of things for you to know about Morning Edition. I assume you all listen to it and you have some knowledge of it, but it's important that you realize 13 million people a week tune in to Morning Edition. It is an unbelievably successful radio show, second only to Rush Limbaugh in sort of the pantheon of <laughs> But it is unbelievable. And, um, and to put that in context of 13 million, 5 million people tune into uh, Good Morning America and the Today Show, and 3 million tuning into CBS This Morning. So it is a tremendous amount of reach that Morning Edition offers us. And I also think it's a collaborative effort that you don't see in journalism. Um, on over 800, or almost, I think, 800 radio stations all across the United States, Morning Edition airs. And in conjunction with the reporting and all the news gathering that David and his colleagues offer from NPR, is the insertion of local content that's produced by WGBH and all the other member stations around the country. So as a journalistic enterprise, it is among the most powerful, uh, not just in the country, but in the world. Um, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about David. Um, since taking on his current role, which about, I think, four years ago now, as a co-host of Morning Edition, uh, he, um, he had been covering the, um, the White House, correct? Uh, you, you were there for a couple of years covering the White House, and um, uh, before that, you were at the Baltimore Sun. Correct. Now, and the reason I bring this up is it's not so much about the bio as it is the transition from print to broadcast, and especially print to radio, which um, we'll hear a little bit about later on. Um, he was a foreign correspondent for NPR based in Moscow. He covered the entire region from Ukraine to the Baltics, um, all the way east to Siberia. Didn't you ride on the railroad too, didn't you? Did. Yeah. And uh, during that time, he brought all of us stories that were as wide ranging as the 25th anniversary of the, the uh, accident at Chernobyl, and also, uh, it's on the other end of the spectrum, but Beatles songs performed by Russian babushkas. Um, <laughs> this is the kind of stuff that David is extremely good at. He spent a month in Libya reporting uh, really the riveting stories, the most difficult circumstances of the NATO uh, bombs that were falling on Tripoli. In fact, he was awarded the uh, Daniel Shore Journalism Prize for that. Um, his voice actually became familiar um, for four years covering the, the White House on the second President Bush's second term in office, um, working out of the West Wing um, in the spacious NPR studios that I'm told are uh, smaller than most broom closets, um, sharing with your colleagues. Um, during the following, uh, the, the, day, the, the aftermath of, of Hurricane Katrina, David Green was aboard Air Force One when President Bush flew over the Gulf Coast to take the first glimpse of uh, really the destruction that was for that area. And again, uh, on the ground in New Orleans, reporting from all the people who were dealing with that unbelievable uh, tragedy and event and for which um, he again won numerous awards. Um, after President Obama took office, uh, David Green kept one eye trained on the White House and the other on the road, which he loves to do. He spent three months driving across the country with a recorder, a camera, uh, as he say, uh, a lot of caffeine as well. And he learned how the recession at that time in 2008 and 2009 were touching Americans during President Obama's first 100 days in office. And before joining NPR, 
in 2005, as I mentioned, he was at the uh, Baltimore Sun, um, uh, where he also covered the White House during the Bush administration's first term. And uh, born in Pennsylvania, went to college at Harvard. Uh, I am extremely pleased to welcome to WGBH and to this particular group tonight, um, our colleague, I like to think of him that way, David Green. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, it is, um, it's great to be back in Boston. I love coming back here. I, I will, Harvard is not bad, um, <laughs> but uh, honestly, the real draw in going to school there was this city. I was looking around colleges with, uh, with my mother um, and just drove through here and fell completely in love. We had a choice the night that we spent here when I was touring Harvard to whether to go see Madame Butterfly or to go to a Sox game. And uh, it was up to me. And um, <laughs> we sat through a very cold night at Fenway. And I think my mother had like a soda dumped on her or something like that. <laughs> and I had to live with that <laughs> for, for, uh, for many years to come. Um, but uh, this is, it's, it's a city that uh, I love for a lot of reasons. And my college roommates and I remain very close. And I think our relationship was really built on, you know, sort of nights and weekends we would spend enjoying this city. I love Boston because it's a sports town. As I was telling Phil earlier, as someone from Pittsburgh, I, uh, I sort of probably unfairly judge cities based on whether they're real sports towns. And living in Washington, D.C., um, I'm so sorry to Washington, but uh, it's not a great sports town. Um, and so living here, I just as a Pittsburgher felt completely at home. Uh, except I probably spend way too much time uh, hating your professional football team. Um, <laughs> but uh, the Patriots had my wife and I sitting not once but twice through AFC Championship games when it was probably only 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but it felt like negative 30 uh, when your team is losing. So thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Um, uh, it's, it's also great to be at WGBH at at just such an exciting time for the news operation on the radio side. I was, I mean, looking at the newsroom and I mean, it just feels like there's such positive energy and excitement about the future right now. I mean, you hear the voices of WGBH staff on Air Air, on Morning Edition, on All Things Considered, including this afternoon, a story about the first penile implant um, at Mass General, which, which is airing on, on All Things Considered today. And so, I mean, it just, it just feels like a really, really exciting moment that the whole WGBH family, including all of yourselves, should, should feel really, really good about. And, you know, on the television side, I mean, no one has sort of led the way more than WGBH. I can't think of PBS programming that you watch, and it's not coming from here. Uh, so it, it really is an honor to, to be invited and, and to come and, and chat with you tonight. Uh, I am, have felt since I came into public broadcasting, you know, in 2005, that I still pinch myself because it feels like the greatest job in the world. Uh, and it feels like we're doing something incredibly important um, and probably becoming even more important in what is a really chaotic, strange, unpredictable media landscape overall. Uh, and I, I want to talk tonight a little bit about sort of what it is that I feel sets us apart um, and why it's so important that we continue doing what we're doing as aggressively and as ambitiously as possible. It, uh, it almost didn't happen for me. Um, I uh, came from the Baltimore Sun, as Phil said, and started in radio and was very fortunate to have uh, a wonderful mentor in my colleague, Don Gagne, who was covering the White House with me. He was giving me all sorts of advice about how to write for radio, how to use sound, um, and even a lot of the basics. You know, he told me that, you know, we had this little radio studio in the basement of the West Wing where we would record our voice and so forth. And he said, you know, David, I, I need to make sure you know that that if, you know, the door that you shut, the soundproof door, once it's closed, you know, it's great because it's soundproof, but as soon as you're done recording something, you should open the door because if you don't, you're sort of 
cut off from the world. I really wish I had taken that piece of advice. Uh, my first day covering the White House alone, uh, I was you know, covering the White House. I was in the booth, I recorded something. I sort of took a moment afterwards. I, I think I might have had TV on. I was just sitting there like, well, I'm covering the White House for NPR. This is, this, is, this is awesome. And the phone rang, and it was our senior Washington editor, Ron Elving. And he was really frantic. And I was trying to be you know, his calm, new reporter. Uh, and he said, David, what's going on there? And I said, oh, yeah, I'm, uh, Ron, I have everything covered. I mean, I've, you know, I've got my story list. I've, I've got everything. I mean, he's like, David, I, I have CNN on right now in the office. Wasn't the White House evacuated? <laughs> and I sort of looked over at that door, uh, which was closed. Um, and I told him I would check on that. Uh, <laughs> so I, I opened the door, and it was, it was dark. Um, and there was like a security light flashing, and no one was there. Uh, and so there was a Secret Service agent who I finally found, and uh, he told me that uh, the White House had been evacuated, and why was I still there? And I said, do you really need to take the time to ask that? I mean, I'd be happy to leave now. And he said, probably it's safer if you stay here. We have a, a small plane that came into White House airspace, and we cleared the building, but it looks like it's going to be sorted out soon, so just stay here. I was like, J check. Um, so I could have gone to Ron and made the argument that I was better positioned to cover this story than any other reporter, but instead I sort of fell on my sword. And when you're a new correspondent at NPR, you know, in a serious news beat, you're sort of excited about being on All Things Considered, you're sort of excited about being on Morning Edition. Your goal is not to land on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. <laughs> but shortly after this happened, Peter Segel's producer called me and uh, I sort of knew it was coming. He was like, yeah, Peter heard that you were kind of stuck in the White House when it was evacuated. Can we call you about that when we're doing the show? So they played Danger Zone by Kenny Loggins. Uh, and it's the song from Top Gun. Uh, and they asked, you know, what building in Washington was evacuated and it was the White House. And Peter said, well, you know, it's, it's everyone was cleared out of that building. The president, I mean, all of his staff, reporters. But NPR's David Green was stuck in the basement. David, hi, what were you doing in the basement? <laughs> So that was great. Um, luckily, I was able to overcome that uh, and uh, am really, really, uh, I do feel like I have the greatest job in the world at Morning Edition. Uh, I came, uh, as Phil said, about four years ago and Steve and Renee could not have been more welcoming of, of this new former print guy. Um, and, you know, the, the show is, it's, it's really exciting right now, and we're, we're trying to push boundaries, we're trying to figure out ways to cover stories like this election, um, like uh, the violence in Paris, you know, in, in ways that really remain true to who we are, um, but also sort of trying new formats and, and trying to, to keep things feeling really fresh, dynamic, and, you know, taking our listeners, all of you, you know, to these places where we are. And so I want to play, I'm, I'm going to play just um, a couple minutes, and what you're going to hear, uh, it's sort of just a, a highlight reel of, of some of the recent places we've been hosting the show live, uh, and then you're going to hear just a couple of the music interviews we've done recently, because that's another place where we've, we've tried to really get, you know, high-profile, interesting musicians on the air and kind of tell their stories through the music in ways that you don't really get, um, you know, when you're meeting musicians in, in other places. And I just need to give you sort of one of those listener advisories um, because you might want to, you might want to turn off the radio if you don't like bad singing. Uh, because I actually, um, I love karaoke, and uh, I decided for some reason to ask a musician if I could sing one of his best songs with him when I was interviewing him which I really don't advise, and I apologize for that ahead of time. But anyway, um, here, here's some of the recent stuff on Morning Edition. And I'm David Green, live in Paris, where people are returning to work this morning after the unimaginable violence Friday night. Right now, what I feel in Paris is not so much suspicion of each other, but a great 
need of warmth and, and, and solidarity. And, and, and I'm David Green at a coffee shop in Des Moines, Iowa, where the snow held out just long enough for people to caucus last night. Now it's piling up. Ted Cruz won on the Republican side. It's Morning Edition from NPR News. I'm Steve Inskeep in Washington. And I'm David Green in Bozeman, Montana. And Steve, there's a large audience here who wants to say hello to you. You know, I think ranchers are the world's best conservatives, actually, as far as preserving land like it is. And we have to take care of our land. If you don't want to go to Fish City, you better detour around my Loretta Lynn, can I ask you about Fist City? You, you wrote that long ago about where a woman who was eyeing your husband might end up, right? Yeah, and she did. She did? <laughs> was it your fist? It was mine. You took care of her. I, I took care of her. Now, when you think of music in 2015, you have got to think Kendrick Lamar. All my life I has to fight. I was raised inside the gang culture, and I've hurt people in my life. It's something I still have to think about when I sleep at night. I can't change the world until I change myself first. Barry Manilow, before I let you go, um, you wouldn't fulfill my bucket list and sing a bar or two of Mandy with me, would you? With you? Yeah. Oh, Mandy, and you came and you gave without taking, but I sent you away. Thanks. Uh, you were great too, Mr. Manilow. Thank you. <laughs> wow. We're still together. We're always TLC. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate First it. First of all, I have to say I love your voice. Yeah, you have a good voice. I'm wow. like, that's gonna. Ooh, you, you're it's making sexy. My, that, that, thank you. So your new name is Big Sexy. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So thanks to thanks to TLC, we have uh, we have track jackets that for the morning edition overnight crew, and my colleagues put "Big Sexy" across the back of the track jacket, which I will be living with um, for the rest of my life. Uh, I, the some of the some of the first moments you heard there, um, uh, you know, after the Paris attacks, our executive producer called me on you know Saturday afternoon and said, you know, here's an editor, here's a producer. You have a Comrex, which is this little machine that basically takes Ethernet, internet, and can turn it into studio quality sound. Uh, you know, we we use that if we're you know going to one of our foreign correspondents live somewhere. You don't normally use that to host an entire radio program, uh, but she took a risk and said, "Take this machine, get to Paris, and do whatever you can to try and host the show from there." And we were in the conference room of this hotel, and we opened the window so you could hear the sound of a Parisian street near the Garden Nord train station. And you know, our colleagues had, you know, Eleanor Beardsley was there, and Dina Temple Raston arrived during the week, who covers counterterrorism. And it felt like we had literally taken part of our operation and our show to a city that was in such pain um, and going through something so hard and unimaginable. And we, we just sort of planted ourselves there. And we've used this model a few times now, you know, in, in Montana and in Iowa for the caucuses. And it, you know, what we hope we're doing is sort of taking you on a trip somewhere together to experience something important, like a terrible tragedy or like an election. And so we're not doing it from our studio. We're literally there all together, sort of taking in the story. And, uh, you know, I hope you've enjoyed the sound, and, and we've really been enjoying sort of experimenting. And fundamentally, though, at the end of the day, I mean, it's all about listening. And, and that's sort of what I want to spend a few minutes on. Because listening, it sounds so easy, especially if you're in the, the broadcasting business. I mean, you listen. But especially in this media environment, especially at a time as human beings when we are spending so much time communicating on, you know, on screens. It's, you know, I don't think we realize how, how the small amount of time we're actually spending listening. And, you know, you, you look at other, other broadcast outlets and, and cable news, and I mean, it's, and I have enormous respect for, for a lot of, of what my colleagues do. But, you know, I, I think what makes us different is 
you know, spending the time to listen and let people think out loud and actually have raw, unpredictable, thoughtful moments. And this has been really important to me um, going back to, to when I was growing up. I was raised by a single mom and she had this, you know, sort of, I mean, she was just this huge personality and um, she was boisterous and fun and, you know, uh, would tell you like it was all the time. And uh, she taught uh, college at Franklin and Marshall College in, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where, where I went to high school. And she was sort of known on campus uh, for walking her two English Springer Spaniels across campus and talking to everybody. I mean, students, other faculty, neighbors just who lived around town, people who worked in facilities, staff at the college. And, and this, was, this was just infectious. And she was always like this. And she always just had this, you know, belief that if you spend some time with someone, you know, something would emerge. And I really felt like she, she just believed that everyone has a story. And it's just a matter of actually listening and being curious and waiting till that story emerges. And, and that really built me, you know, as a journalist and, and as a person. And I hold that you know, very dear, um, you know, as, as I do my work. And there was a, a, a day like no other in my life. Um, uh, this was the spring after Hurricane Katrina, and George W. Bush was taking a trip down to New Orleans to, to check in on, on people who had lost their homes. And I followed him into the Upper Ninth Ward, and he was meeting with um, a woman named Ethel Williams, who was in her 70s, her home in the Upper Ninth Ward was just obliterated, and she was showing basically the president you know, what was left. And it was one of those classic White House photo ops. Um, you know, we stood there, and Mrs. Williams and the president came out, and he said, you know, I'm gonna get you your house back, and she said, when you do, I'm gonna cook you some gumbo and dirty rice, and they shared a laugh, uh, and then we were rushed off and went to the plane and got on Air Force One. And I remember calling my mother from the tarmac, and uh, she had just won this teaching award at Franklin and Marshall. And you know, I congratulated her and was gonna go up and, and see her for the ceremony. And so we took off, uh, and I landed at Andrews Air Force Base, and got off the plane and was checking my voicemail. And there was this unimaginable voicemail from one of her colleagues in the psychology department telling me that my mother had passed away suddenly. And this was while I was in the air. And you can imagine I remember every second of what happened afterwards. I mean, I got into a taxi and I'm just completely shaken. And the driver is asking me what's wrong. And I told her that my mother died and she starts crying. And I remember like thinking like, why are you crying? <laughs> um, and, you know, every second stays with me. And as I got through the, the pain um, and you know, got back to work after, after a month or so, you know, it, I started reflecting a lot. And just the fact that I had met Ethel Williams on that day and, you know, sort of my mother wanting to spend time with people, um, I just had to go back. And so, you know, I pitched to my editors, could I go back and, and see Mrs. Williams and, and sort of really follow her story and not just make it a photo op? And so I was more determined than ever to go as a listener and to not go with any preconceived notions of what I was going to hear. I mean, I could have, you know, if a pollster had done statistical analysis of New Orleans and had said she is an African-American voter in the middle of New Orleans um, who doesn't have much money, she's probably not gonna like a Republican president. But that was the kind of stuff I just didn't even wanna, wanna contemplate. So I went and spent time with her and she was just, such a beautiful, inspiring person. And I would sit in the living room of her daughter's house where she was staying, and uh, you know, she would say to me, I'm gonna get my house back. The president's, you know, George W. Bush, is, he's my friend. And I would look at her and I would say, Mrs. Williams, um, I mean, some might say that a politician is not the person you should be putting all your faith in to get your house back. She would say, what's your name again, David? I'm gonna call you when I get my house back. And so I went down and, and followed her story. Um, and I, you know, I 
wish it ended better. She did finally get federal funding um, to rebuild her house through a federal program, uh, but she uh, had gotten cancer and passed away right around the time when she would have started to build a new house. But you know, Ethel Williams and my mom sort of stay there with me all the time as I, as I try to do my job. And you know, I'll tell you, a couple ways that this really manifests itself in, in the kind of journalism that's very important to me. You know, when we were coming up to the Supreme Court decision on same-sex marriage, um, I, I had thought that our coverage of that issue and that question had been, had been good, um, but it, it felt like something was missing. You know, we did a lot of stories about same-sex couples getting married. Um, we had, you know, a lot of viewpoints on the air from, from you know, religious leaders who didn't believe that marriage applied to same-sex couples, you know, but it felt like this was just a moment where thinking in this country was evolving and people were really sort of, you know, looking in, inwards and figuring out what they believed and, and what they could overcome. And I just wanted so desperately to, to capture that and be a listener. And so a colleague of mine, a, a producer, um, Maggie Penman, who's a, a brilliant producer, she was at Morning Edition, uh, we went to North Dakota together. And we went there and just spent a week listening. We spoke to a woman named Melanie Hoffert who had written a book called Prairie Silence about coming out on the North Dakota prairie. We spoke to an auto mechanic who spent time next to the cars he was fixing in his auto shop, um, telling me why he thinks that homosexuality is a sin and why he you know, continues to share that with his children. We talked to a farmer um, who said that he believed that same-sex couples should have all the rights of everyone else, but that this word marriage, just something in him can't quite get there because he has different tools in his shed and there are different names for the different tools. And he was just trying to get there because he so fundamentally believed in equal rights and was struggling with the term marriage. And so in our interview with Melanie, the woman who had written this book, you know, I said, so if you and your partner decide to get married, um, what is your family going to think? And she said, I don't know. I said, you, have, you haven't talked about this yet? And she said, not really. Why don't you ask them? And I thought she was kind of joking, <laughs> uh, but she wasn't. And she arranged for us to go have pizza at her parents' house that night. And they invited the whole family there. So over pizza, uh, Melanie was sitting there. We had our microphones out. Um, Melanie's dad wanted nothing to do with this. Uh, he said hello and then sort of went away. But it was Melanie's mom talking to, re reminding us of the conversation she had had with Melanie when, when she came out to her mom. And Melanie's two brothers and two sisters were also at the table. And so one of her, uh, her brother's wives, her sister-in-law, April, you know, was describing to us you know, when she learned that Melanie's gay and you know, she said that she embraced Melanie, told you, you know, I love you no matter what, even though you know, I don't necessarily understand everything. Uh, and it was sort of a beautiful moment. And then we sort of kept talking about this more, and I brought up the, the issue of marriage. And so April very quickly got up from the table and left. And it was a little awkward. And so her family starts explaining to me that you know, she is um, a very devout Catholic and, you know, had been told by her priest in church that same-sex marriage is not acceptable and that she's really trying to work that out with, and, and with her love for her sister-in-law. So as they're describing what Melanie is, what, what April is thinking, April is getting more and more upset that we're talking about her at the table and she just, she curses, she slams the door and leaves all of which was on tape. And so Melanie's mother looks at me and says, you're not gonna use that, are you? <laughs> and Melanie looked at her mom and said, uh, Mom, uh, David and Maggie are journalists, and that's, and Melanie knew what we were, she was like, that's kind of exactly what they came for. And so we, we left pretty quickly afterwards, and you know, we flew out of North Dakota and spent days talking to editors about what to do with this. I mean, it was an incredibly private moment that we had been invited into. And we stayed in touch with Melanie. And Melanie came to a point where, you know, she told us that as long as we 
explained that April did not hate her or something, and that the stress that she was feeling was because she loved her sister-in-law and was sort of really working this out and didn't want to be misrepresented at the table. You know, that she felt like this would be a really good thing for many families in this country to hear. And maybe that Melanie's family going through this, you know, on our air, would convey to other families that it's okay to sort of go through something hard and to disagree and to work something out together and you still love each other. And somehow in, in Melanie sort of talking about it in that way, it, it seemed like almost a metaphor for the country going through hard moments together. And it felt like the kind of journalism that, that we're doing when we're at our best. Um, it's, it's the raw, it's the real, it's the thinking out loud that comes when you actually take the time to listen. And, you know, all of this stays with me as we're covering this campaign. And I, you know, I think that, that as this campaign gets towards November, it is really important to, to scrutinize the candidates and to do our jobs in that sense and to ask the hard questions and to dig and to investigate. And it's also really important to remember that, that an election you know, is about voters and to listen to how voters are, are coming to their decisions and, and connecting sort of their votes to their own lives. And you know, I just think of some of the voters, I've, the voters I've heard from recently. I was in Pittsburgh and my Uber driver um, uh, turned out to be a fascinating character. His name's Frank Sinatra. <laughs> uh, he, showed, he showed me his driver's license. And so Frank, you know, talked very openly about this frustration in feeling like, you know, he is working two jobs. He's driving an Uber car and he's working um, at a technology company during the day. His wife is a school teacher and she's working at a restaurant in the evening. And they, you know, can't afford to go on vacation more than maybe once every two years. And his father was a coal miner, a steel worker. Um, and I mean, had it so much easier in his mind. And what, what Frank talked about was this feeling that um, the government is giving out too much, you know, to other families and not supporting middle class families like his own. And he had come to a place where he was very likely to vote for Donald Trump. And so I'm, I'm listening to Frank and it, it re what's really emerging is sort of a lot of the frustration um, that you heard from a lot of Reagan Democrats in, in the 80s and sort of a view of government that, that led them to, to make you know, a, a pretty bold political choice. Frank also told me that his wife sort of agreed with him, but if Donald Trump said one more thing about women that was offensive, it was over, she was out. And he just said to me, There's, there won't be anything I can do about that. I mean, I won't be able to convince her. You know, I remember being in Chicago and listening to a young man who had served prison time for a first time drug offense and never forgave Bill Clinton for that. And that's why he was voting for Bernie Sanders. You know, and a community activist in Chicago who felt like she had just heard for so many years that the federal government through block grants and everything else was going to help neighborhoods like Englewood. And she was just fed up and wanted something different, was voting for Bernie Sanders. And then a farmer recently in Montana who is getting teary-eyed sitting on his bar stool in this remote little bar in a farm town with dirt roads and telling me that Obamacare saved his wife's life because she got insurance, you know, literally weeks before she was diagnosed with cancer and got all the treatments and was living because of Obamacare. And I mean, he made the most impassioned plea for Hillary Clinton to be president that I've ever heard in all the interviews I've done. Basically that, that I mean, this is a woman who fought for, for universal health care years ago and that he sees his wife as the embodiment of why that's needed. And you know, he said she's been beaten up for so long, it is just time. And so it, it's almost like when you listen, you can create this quilt that becomes kind of the electorate and it becomes a story that is about people and lives and their votes. And I don't know what you think about a lot of sort of the way elections are covered today, but that's the way I think an election should be covered. Um, and that is what we do in public broadcasting. And we've always been listeners, but at this moment it is more important than ever before that we, I mean, remain absolutely committed to being respectful listeners and to take the time to let people think out loud. And if we can do that, I think these are gonna be very, very exciting and fulfilling times uh, in, in the job that we're in. 
So I will stop there, and I know, I know Phil wants to, uh, to bring me up and continue the conversation, but thank you for listening. Make this, um, we're going to make this very informal. I just want to start by asking a couple of questions, and we'll open it up for any of you that have uh, questions. <laughs> um, David, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I have to ask, because I think everybody here is curious, but somebody who does a shift that starts at 5 o'clock in the morning, what is your day like? What is your, what is your work day like? What time do you wake up? What do you do? And do you ever see your wife? Uh, I'll start with answering the last question, no. Um, my wife owns uh, a restaurant in Washington, D.C., and she remains very committed to being there as much as possible. And it's, uh, it is, the bar remains open till 2 in the morning on weekdays. So she's often there till 2 in the morning. Uh, I wake up at 2.46. Not sure why I started setting my alarm for 2.46. I think 2.45 felt too painful, so I added a minute, and it just became, <laughs> it just became a routine. Yeah, so I wake up then uh, and s hopefully see my wife for a little bit of time. Um, and uh, there's, I get on my iPhone and there's uh, a note from our fabulous overnight staff at the show, basically laying out what the show looks like, um, saying, you know, you have, you know, a, a conversation to tape with Eleanor Beardsley at 4 a.m. that's going to be in the show. You have a live conversation with this senator, uh, and sort of I know what I'm getting into, and I get to the office around 3.30 or 3.45 and, and start sort of doing some of the writing for the show and uh, the prepping for the interviews, and then the show's Now, one of your colleagues is in California, so how do you guys communicate? Yeah, so, so when, when Renee and I are hosting together, she's at NPR West in Culver City, and we have a, a video feed, so I can see her on video. Um, and then she can actually see the director in Washington, and the director can see her. So the director, he or she, is actually cueing Renee from there. And, and it, you know, we're, we're sort of sharing the air, but, but uh, not together. But we actually have, we have this crazy red phone in the studio, one in Washington and one in, uh, at NPR West. It looks like, I mean, it looks like what the president would pick up if he or she had to declare nuclear war. Um, it's like this big this big red light that flashes if Renee's trying to call me or if I'm trying to call Renee. And that's because it would take so long to figure out how to connect us and not accidentally have it live on the air. Um, so it's, it's fun to have a way that, you know, if, if Renee wants to say something at the last minute. And we'll often be talking and scare the daylights out of the director because we'll still be in a conversation with like six seconds left and talking about like, yeah, why don't you read that part of the intro? And then if you, no, 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 yeah, 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 take the second line, take the second, take the second. this is Morning Edition from NPR <laughs> News. <It's, laughs> Well, we have, uh, there are a number of uh, staffers who really, uh, when David Green comes to your station, it's a big deal. And some of them are here uh, tonight, and some of them get up at 2.46 in the morning to help uh, craft what is this integrated, collaborative uh, effort. And it's good to know we're not alone. I mean, it's so, it's good to know that we have a family. I was going to say, there are hour. thousands of people who yeah. are all getting out of bed at this ungodly hour in order for 13 million people to, uh, to, to know what's going on. Um, we all are aware of how media is changing. You alluded to it. How is Morning Edition and NPR thinking about online and streaming and Twitter and all the things that are apparently uh, challenging some of the ways in which people are getting their information these days? You know, I'll, I'll tell you one moment. Uh, that, that'll help answer that question. We, we have this new movement within NPR called Generation Listen. And it's basically an effort to connect with, you know, new audiences. The focus was supposed to be largely younger audiences, but there have been a lot of not so young audiences who have said, hey, why can't Gen Listen be, you know, connecting with me too? And it's, it's a way to, to sort of rethink how we're connecting and, and make sure that we're engaging, you know, using new technologies and and giving you know, listeners who might not have listened to NPR in the past sort of the kind of sound they want. And I was doing an event with the Generation Listen board a few months ago, and we were talking about this very question. And one of the board members said something that still stays with me, and it gave me chills at the time. Um, she said, stop worrying about changing your content. We're all young listeners. We love what you do, you just gotta figure out, you know, all the options to deliver it. And I think that, that that has been really important to me because I 
I think I've been stressing out sometimes in years past about how we can, how we can craft content in a way that younger people might like more and make it, I don't know, more, just a sound different. And to hear someone who's sort of leading this effort saying, look, we, we love the content. It's on us to, to create all sorts of ways to, to deliver it. And I think, I think in many ways we're, you know, we're doing it, you're doing it, you know, we're, we're figuring it out together. Um, and I think that three or four years ago, I was really pessimistic. I mean, I, I thought no one owned a radio anymore. What the hell am I doing here? What, what is, what's going to be happening in 10 years? And now it, it's like people love sound and audio storytelling and just the kind of journalism that, that I love. And, and it feels like, I mean, that's really exciting. And, and we have a lot to figure out when it comes to getting the technology right. And, you know, but it, it just, that fundamentally feels good because it's, it is exactly what we've always done. Well, it's an interesting thing too because I, um, as somebody who came up mostly on the radio side, it's still the one medium that you can do other things while you're consuming. I mean, you can't do that with print and you certainly can't do it with video. And so as we are increasingly in this sort of time poverty uh, zone that we all are living in, um, I think audio has had this re remarkable renaissance, some of it technologically connected because now the iPhone becomes almost your transistor radio for those of you old enough to remember that. Um, and I think it works that way. So before we open it up to some questions here, I have to ask you, what do you do when you're not working? What are you into? What are your hobbies? What do you like to? <laughs> um, I mean, I love traveling. My wife and I travel as much as we possibly can. And, and that, often, that often is when we get to spend really quality time together. We just spent a week in Colombia just exploring a new place together. We were in Mexico together recently. I, we both love traveling so much. Her restaurant is international street food based on our travels. Um, and often, this is kind of sad, I'm, I'm watching Pittsburgh sports. I was going to say, you said you're I mean, a I big have, sports I have the MLB app on my iPhone, and often it's like I'm getting up at 2.46 in the morning, and I realize I'm watching the eighth inning of a Pirates game at like 10.30 at night in bed. That's not smart. That's How just are you doing that? I, I have to say, I'm looking at Marilyn Scherer, who's our producer for Morning Edition here in Boston, and she's shaking her head. <laughs> uh, see now, well, you, I saw a tweet from you at Fenway on Friday, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See? So, but you didn't want to give up the baseball, right? Yeah, yeah. Nap. It takes... Great. You, do you nap? It takes, like, I do. strategic power napping. Nap. Yeah. Power, nap. power naps are critical. I told David that Bob Sue, who's our morning host for Morning Edition, said when I told him you were coming, he was very excited, and I said, well, would you like to come? You certainly can come. And he said, that's way past my bedtime. I can't do that. <laughs> although, had it been a baseball game. That's right. Although, you're not on the air tomorrow morning, are you? So. I'm not. All right. Well, that's his excuse. Yes. So I'm sure you all have some questions, please. Uh, I think we have mics that can roll around, but uh, it's pretty good acoustics here. So yes. So, hi. Hi. Uh, all hail to the power of storytelling. Um, um, but I'm, I want to ask you if you think, um, is this working? I want to ask you if you think um, the hard questions for, especially in, in the election, uh, are missing. Um, for candidates, for the candidates. And I'm speaking to you as a White House correspondent, I'm speaking, I'm sure you, we've all seen and heard the hard, hard questions that the Prime Minister of Great Britain gets in front of Parliament. I just feel like those questions are not being posed in the political climate, particularly given what we're facing um, with candidate Trump. Uh, I. I would say that oftentimes the hard questions are not being asked. Um, I, would make, I would make the argument, and, and I, I invite you to push back, that we are asking the hard questions on our air. Um, I mean, I think about you know, asking Hillary Clinton about the email investigation and pressing her on that, asking her why a young man stood up at a debate and said, young people don't trust you. Can you please make an argument for why they should? I remember sitting in Bernie Sanders' office, um, I mean, asking him one question after another after another about his gun record, which he, he had never seemed to fully sort of come clean on. And finally, he described, like, look, I'm from Vermont. Um, and it was a really honest, I mean, it was sort of an, an, an honest grappling answer. I remember sitting next to Ben Carson and digging in on foreign policy and getting him to sort of explain you know, what he would do with countries like Libya as president and how, what his relationship would be with Putin. 
uh, I think right now you're, you're seeing some tough questions to Trump about you know, tax returns, which I think is, is, is good, and, and those questions should continue to be asked over and over again. Donald Trump has not come on our air, uh, which um, is both enormously frustrating and it makes me think that maybe he actually believes he's going to be asked the tough questions that, that he hasn't necessarily been asked. And so I, so what, what can we do? I can, we bring someone like Jan Brewer on, the, the former governor of Arizona. And I went into that, I went into that interview believing, so here is, here's a former governor and policymaker, you know, who is advising Donald Trump. And she had created um, a very, very tough immigration law in Arizona, parts of which were struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court, which was basically gave a police officer the right to walk up to anyone and say, prove to me that you are in this country legally. And that was largely struck down by the court. And so, I mean, I never thought that when you heard Donald Trump talk about this mass deportation, that he was ever challenged as to how he would exactly carry that out. So here was Jan Brewer, who I thought, you know, might know a thing or two about that. And I kept pressing her, you know, asking, you know, what is, is basically what you tried to do in Arizona, is that what Donald Trump would be thinking about? And as aggressively as I pushed, there was no answer, which I hope was revealing in itself to listeners. You know, I asked her, so what is a wall? And she said to me, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. <laughs> and I was like, well, maybe it's time that we start asking that. And so I would, and, I, and if you listen to, you know, to, to Steve's interviews with, with President Obama and, and with other candidates, I mean, I, I would make the argument that when we get those, the candidates on, we are asking the questions that should be asked a lot more. Um, but I absolutely hear you, and, and I have some of the very same concerns, believe me. I'm going to stand up. Um, I have a 10 year old grandson. When he has an experience, like you offer him a, chocolate, a whole chocolate chip cookie, he does this, but he's really positive. But it's two thumbs up, <laughs> this big smile. So they thank you. Well, the, the talk was just really, really helpful. However, what that gets you is one hardball question and one just difficult question. So which, way, which is first, difficult or hardball? <laughs> I'm going to let you tell me. OK. Um, I'd like, you've talked about yourself and some of your, your, your colleagues on NPR. I'd like you to step back for a minute and tell me how well you think media in general is doing. I think that was a great question just a minute ago about asking difficult questions, but you talked about a different piece of it, which was the actual listening, the actual wanting to get in touch with what the American public is thinking. So I'd like you to step back and uh, assess, not NPR, but media in general on that dimension. The second question. Was that the hardball or the difficult one? <laughs> <laughs> I viewed it as the hardball. Okay, good. That makes me feel good. So this will be a little easier. The We're um, going to give you the thumbs yeah. up. <laughs> <laughs> The, the difficult one is your point about listening, which is absolutely spot on, and we just need to do so much more of that. As a, not just radio announcers and broadcasters, but as a society, we do terrible at it. So if you could put on your genius cap, how could we go about educating our society or changing the habits of our society so as to enable more people to listen better. I think it's critically important. Let me take the, f the second question first. Um, I mean, there are a million different ways I could answer that question. I will, I will just say this. I was sitting at a restaurant in Mexico a couple weeks ago, and I saw four kids who were playing with one another. Probably they were eight, nine, ten years old. And they were each on their mobile device playing the same game against one another, um, not actually interacting with one another at all. Um, I am not a parent. Many of you might be, so low be it for me to tell you how to parent. But if I were a parent, I would not allow that. I mean, I would just, I would stop that. Because, I mean, I am scared as hell as to what kind of adults those kids are going to be if, if that's allowed right now. And again, I. I can't, put, I can't put myself in the shoes of a parent and know how hard it is and kind of the, the tension involved in taking a mobile device away from your son or daughter, but, but as you asked me to step back, like stepping back, that looked bad. 
Uh, and your media question, um, I mean, I, th I think you can tell as I talk about the importance of listening that I don't think it's happening nearly enough. I mean, this campaign has just, you know, we hear a lot of people who call themselves journalists who are doing a lot of talking and offering a lot of opinions and listening to themselves. And, you know, maybe I'm old fashioned, but I grew up learning about, you know, Walter Cronkite and Edward R. Murrow and believing that, I mean, that desk where Steve and I sit, you know, in the morning and that desk in, at NPR West where Renee is sitting, I still want to believe that that is sacred. That is an anchor desk. And what comes from my mouth, I mean, is not an opinion. I mean, it is, it is facts, it is journalism. You know, it's, it's, it's making compelling radio. It's doing storytelling. But, you know, it's not, you, you don't need to hear what I think. You don't need to hear my views. It's bringing people on with different perspectives. I mean, it's sort of learning together. It's being curious together and exploring the news together. I mean, that anchor desk isn't sacred anymore. You know, you see people on, on television behind a desk, and, and I don't think you always know what you're getting and where it's coming from. Um, and I think that's truly, truly dangerous. And, and this, this, is, this is a really important moment and a really difficult election to cover because there are many people who have very strong opinions about different candidates. And I think there's a lot of pressure uh, on journalists um, to sort of have the same kind of tough judgment about candidates. And we can't fall into that trap. And, and it's hard, but we cannot fall into that trap because you know, we have a role to play in a democracy. Um, and if we fall into that trap and, and start you know, becoming advocates, and stop doing our jobs, then we're giving up that role in democracy. And where does that leave us? You know, then you have you know, whoever the next president is unchecked because we as an institution have, have failed. And that's really, really scary. So I mean, my, my concern when you ask me to step back is you know, that, that we're not keeping our eye on the ball enough. We need to do the job we've always done. We need to get back to, to basics and make sure that we're covering an election fairly and that the election is about, I mean, scrutinizing and holding all of the candidates to task and asking the tough questions, and also making sure that this election is about voters and not navel-gazing on the part of the media. Thank you for the question. You can tell I get a little passionate I think about I it. I just want to make sure I have my cues correctly here. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Yes, you've had your hand up. Yes, I suspect that everybody here is self-selected as a news junkie. Anyone so, not a news junkie in here? Yeah, why would you be <laughs> okay, here? Good. Okay. Um, so I'm curious about whose reporting you, s you wanna hear about. If something breaks, who, who do you go to? What, new what reporters specifically, print and broadcast, do you say, I wanna see her, her take on that. Uh, I mean, it, it really, it depends on, it depends on sort of the, the, um, the topic, yeah. I mean, I, I have a personal fascination with Russia and my colleague Julia Yaffe, who I you know, knew in Russia, she writes for New York Times Magazine, she writes for other news outlets. I, uh, she's Russian herself, I think she's spot on and she has a deep understanding of Vladimir Putin that I've, I've never really seen before. Um, I mean, I think Julie Hirschfeld Davis is covering the hell out of the White House uh, and she writes for the New York Times and I really, you know, I trust her a lot. Um, David Sanger at the Times, I mean, in terms of international issues, I mean, I, I trust a lot. Uh, you know, it's, it, it varies, um, but I, and this is going to sound sort of self-promotional, but I, I, I trust my colleagues, um, and I really listen to them a lot. You know, I don't think there's anyone better at kind of taking a political moment or a primary result and sort of telling us what it means, but sticking to the facts, but telling us what it means than Mara Eliasson, and I love her her pieces on the morning after an election. You know, I think Don Gagne, who is my radio mentor, taps into kind of voters and their lives better than anyone I can, I can possibly imagine. Uh, you know, I think about, you know, my colleagues abroad um, who put themselves, you know, their lives at risk all the time. You know, I think Alice Fordham tells stories from Iraq that make me, 
you know, continue to care about that country and understand the intricacies of, of sort of the ethnic fault lines in that country in a way like no one else does. Uh, you know, and I could just, you know, I could, I could keep going. Um, but I, you know, I, and, and I think sometimes, sometimes cable news can get a bad rap, and, and deservedly so in cases. But, but I have a lot of colleagues there who are, who are real pros and real classy. You know, I have a colleague, Jeff Zeleny, who worked for the Chicago Tribune and then the New York Times, and we covered the White House together in politics. He went to ABC, and he is now, you know, one of their chief political reporters. And I think the absolute world of him. Uh, so I, I, you can tell my list is, my list is long. Um, but, uh, but there are a lot of people I really respect. Do we have time for one more? I see one more. Is there one more that... Well, I'm going to uh, play house favorites here and <laughs> see if Marilyn has a question. I, I have an inside baseball uh, question ah. in terms of um, morning edition and posing questions and trying to be uh, direct with a limited amount of time mm -hmm. for your live interviews or pre-taped. How is it that you're able to target exactly what you hope to achieve within that interview and get the information out? And I also wanted to add, I think your reactions are always just right from the gut, you always seem to ask the next thing that I would ask or I think what other listeners are asking. How is it that you accomplish that? I say a prayer before going into <laughs> doing it. <laughs> um, thank you for the, the kind word, I appreciate that. It, uh, it's among the hardest things that I think we do. Um, and I think that one of the big dangers is when you're nervous about that, you start not listening and then things really unravel. And so, you know, if it's, if we have, I'm, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think of, um, of a good example. Uh, what about the preparation? Um, yeah, so, I'll, I'll, so John, John Tester, the Democratic Senator from Montana, uh, I knew that I had seven minutes with him live, and he was sitting right next to me at, at that cafe in Bozeman, Montana. Mm -hmm. And so in preparation, uh, you know, I was, I was talking to editors, I was talking to producers, and you know, the, the conversation w was going some, something like this. You know, I wanted to really focus on gun rights because John Tester is a Democrat. This country has been through, you know, some really sensitive conversations about, about gun rights in recent years. And he has, he had for a long time, like an A++ rating from the NRA. I thought that was really something interesting to explore. I was getting some, um, you know, some, some different views from, from my colleagues who were saying, you know, you're, you're in a, you're in a real pro-gun state. It's like, what's, what exactly is the tension here that we're exploring? And, and they, they had an absolutely good case to make. I thought I had a good case to make that we should focus the interview on, on guns. I mean, it's so that's the kind of conversation that would happen. And so we, we sort of crafted the questions and, and had some voices of Montanans talking about guns that I had sort of at the ready to play for the senator. And we decided you know, that, that this is this rare moment where we're in a senator's state. And he's a farmer, and he had literally finished planting his crops the day before coming on. So I sort of in my head was like, let's spend like a minute on that. Let's let people get to know him a little bit. Let's get to guns. Um, and then there was this other issue that, that my colleagues you know, had said this, this would be maybe even more important than guns. It was, it was international trade. And uh, that what we had heard from some cattle ranchers was that the more trade, the better. And they were really worried that, that Democrats were, were sort of backing away from the TPA. A TPP, um, and so I was going to go from sort of on the farm to guns to trade, and then I really wanted to finish with sort of a, a more Montana uh, kind of asking him, you know, about how, how a lot of people in Montana seemed to be very private and what he thought about that, and then thanking him for being there. So you know, we we're, in, we're like four minutes in. He's telling me about um, being. Uh, spending time with some of the victims at the elementary school in Connecticut. And he's nearly breaking down talking about this and talking about guns. And so I had to make a game time decision. I was like, I'm not leaving this issue. I'm not suddenly going to you know, say, anyway, Senator, so about trade. Um, <laughs> and that was, that was on me. And, and I had to, you know, if I had editors who, who thought that it was too focused on guns, I mean, it was, they, they may very well be right. And, and I had to kind of own that. But you know, it kept it on guns, and then sort of had a nice Montana goodbye. Uh, and I don't know. I felt good about the interview. You could you could argue that maybe, 
you, you know, no one wanted to hear from a Montana senator about guns for five and a half minutes. But, but those are the kinds of choices that you make. And I think, I think it, especially live, you know, you've got a plan and sort of a script. You've got the clock to manage because you have to hit those posts. Although people like, unless people or people like Phil get very angry if I <laughs> bust a segment and sort of destroy the coverage in the morning across America. Um, and so you, you, have to, you know, it is a lot to manage, and it's it's really easy to start worrying about the clock, worrying about the the next question you want to ask, and then suddenly you've spent thirty seconds not actually listening to what the person is saying. It's one of the hardest things in hosting, uh, and I am so far from perfect at that, and I'm still working on it all the time because of the stress of live radio and sort of those in-the-moment decisions are, are hard, but you just have to sort of have confidence and realize that it's live radio and that if you did the same interview tomorrow, it could be totally different, but it's just a conversation we're, we're sharing and we're all a part of, and it's just gonna, gonna sort of go forward like a conversation. Well, the good news about these little intimate visits is that uh, we have in the atrium a little reception set up on your behalf. And if you have some questions, I am fairly confident that David will be happy to talk to you about them. Um, <laughs> be, uh, yes, those would be the yeah. preferred questions, the double thumbs up. Um, we want to thank you for flying across the country overnight. Uh, to be with us today. When are you on the air next? When will we hear you next on the radio? Uh, a week from today. A week Monday. from today. So yeah. we'll we look forward to hearing David in a kind of different way. And thank you all again for coming for your support of WGBH and what we do here every day. And we have a number of staff members in here because they wanted to get to see you in person. We listen to you intently, but we don't always get to see you. So thanks for coming. Thank you all for being here and enjoy the reception. Thank you all very much.